Okay. So, the psychological perspective. So, psychodynamic models. So, psychoanalytic theory is the theoretical model developed by Freud that is based on the belief that the roots of psychological problems involve unconscious motives and conflicts that can be traced back to childhood, also called psychoanalysis. So, our life experience, how the mental representations, fantasies, um, ideas, how we respond, how our parents treated us, life events, all of these formative processes and formative relationships play a role into who we are and how we respond to stress and anxiety, depression, etc. And Freud, and I started talking about this last class, the divided mind theory, you know, the idea that the mind is divided, that we're always torn between different things. Um, you know, should I go to class today, or should I stay home and sleep? Um, should I go to work today, or should I call out and chill? You know what I mean? Um, should I smoke that joint, or should I do my homework? You know what I mean? Uh, you know, we're always, and, and that's why I like Freud's theory, because I think that we're always kind of caught in that. We're always, those scenarios come up day in and day out. It's, it's how, to me, it's a good, it captures how the mind actually works. I, I like that, that there are different parts of us, there are different parts of our minds, different parts of our personality that we, we are divided, you know, there, there may be a, kind of like a, a tree of self, you know, like the uh, a part of us is the, the root and it branches out into these various parts. And so to, the conscious of Freud is the part of the mind that corresponds to our present awareness. You guys are all aware right now, paying attention, the pre-conscious, the part of the mind that contains memories, not in awareness, but can be brought into awareness by focusing attention on them. Like, remember that time I graduated from college? How fun was that? And then the unconscious to Freud is the part of the mind that lies outside the range of ordinary awareness and that contains instinctual urges, so hunger and uh, sexual drive. And part of what is guiding us, part of our past that is guiding our present behavior, that is guiding who we are. So if we can uncover um, aspects and traits of our unconscious, we can learn more about ourselves and change and become something different in the present. Okay. okay. So the structure of the mind, so the conscious, the pre-conscious, and the unconscious, or, and also the superego, the id, and the ego. So like I said before, the, the, the ego is in the middle, and the id is the devil on one shoulder, and the superego is the uh, angel on the other. Um, Although superego can bombard you with uh, demands, moral demands as well. Um, it can be what we call the inner critic. So your conscience isn't always your friend. Um, your conscience can kind of make you feel like you're never doing good enough. You're, 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 you know, people who have had an excessive superego uh, can feel, can have an inner critic always putting them down. So that they need to get more in touch with their id drives, with their pleasure drives, to feel more uh, fulfilled in life and less uh, putting themselves down. So, so um, there, although so people like to characterize superego as the conscience, it can also have that pers that that, pers that uh, persona of a, of a inner critic that kind of puts you down as well. And ego is in the middle, trying to figure things out. And um, okay, so let's go a little bit more into what this is. Okay, so the id is the original and unconscious psychic structure present at birth that contains primitive instinctual instincts and is regulated by the pleasure principle. The pleasure principle is the governing principle of the id. It involves demands for immediate gratification of needs. Um, so I want to eat now and do my homework later. I want to have fun now. Do something later. So the the, the, the it is driven by pleasure. Um, and the ego is the psychic structure governed by the reality principle. It organizes reasonable ways of coping with frustration and seeks to curb the demands of the id. Like okay, like all right, man, like I can't you know um, smoke that joint now or go to my girlfriend's house now. I, I need to do my homework now, but I'll do that later, right? It's like not realistic for me to have pleasure now. I need to. I need to go to work, and then afterwards, I mean, so, 
so that the ego helps to regulate the it a little bit and um, and you know is based more in reality than just on pure pleasure. I can have everything my way any day. Um, so here's a little so so when when we talk about the it, you know, the unconscious, the original and unconscious psychic structures. So, so this is this is who you were before language, before language, and this is really really important because. Uh, it is the source of who you were, of your um, of aggressive and sexual drive. And Lacan, who is a psychoanalyst that came after Freud, talked about the importance of the unconscious. Um, in American psychoanalytic theory, they became really hung up on the ego and how we can have a strong ego. And we'll, let me explain a little bit about how this works. So Lacan came up with this idea called the mirror phase. Explain a little bit about how this works. This is a mirror. This is mom and dad, and you. You are all looking at this mirror. So what he's saying there is that um, why he uses this metaphor, why he uses this, it's because he's saying that before language, before language, you are the it, a, a, a ball of of urges and drives and instincts and and he says that children are dependent on their parents and they become really really good at figuring out what their parents want because we are dependent on them for love, nurturance, shelter and we realize that they could abandon us or leave us at some point so children become excellent really good at figuring out what their parents want so your parents per program you with words, with language, and language is the structure of your consciousness. The words that they give you are become the structure of consciousness. So a way to look at this would be like the brain is is the um, the hard drive and the um, the uh, you know the, the consciousness language is the operating system. It's the windows, it's it's the programs, it's the the, the, the data that's that you look that you see in your screen. So which is why that computer is constructed kind of you know similarly to the human mind because the human mind built the computer so it makes sense that we would have an operating system that interacts with the way our own mind works right so language structures consciousness consciousness and one of the psychoanalysts in perspective consciousness has nothing to do with the brain consciousness has everything to do with language although the brain is the seat of consciousness right it's the hardware language is the operating system so your parents give you the words and you build an ego off of what they want, off of who they want you to be, right? So they tell you who they want, but what's the, the interesting thing about a mirror, and this is why Lacan uses this, is that they can only tell you half of who you are. They, they can't tell you all of who you are because there is a part of you, this, that they cannot name, that they cannot speak to, and so they you build an ego based on who they want you to be, and then in adolescence, when sexual drive reemerges on the scene, right? When sexual drive reemerges on the scene, you realize that there was a part of you that your parents could never name, that they could never speak to, and that part reemerges, and now there's a conflict, yeah? Which is why adolescence is a becoming, which is a, a struggle, uh, an awakening, a, a questioning of who am I? And who am I going to be, right? And and it's a kind of a rebellion against parents. You realize that your parents didn't have it all figured out. That that they that they don't have all the answers, right? And that there's and you have to integrate this part of you with this ego, and you have to question like, okay, like what of what my parents taught me am I going to hold on to, and what am I going to disregard? Who do I want to become? Does this make sense to you guys? Does this make yeah. Sense? Yeah. yeah. All right. So that's why Lacan uses. What he calls the mirror phase. It's way more complicated than that in the like, theory, but I'm really trying to just break it down as simple as I can as to how the ego develops and why, as we say, the ego is not your amigo. <laughs> because it was built on what your parents want you to be. It is, it is the ego is that part of why uh, you know the part that wants to be normal, that wants to be like everybody else, that wants to assimilate. You know what I mean? So we want to get in touch with our who we really are, our core self, and integrate all these aspects of our personality. So that is, you know, a quick little um, explanation of how um, ego is formed and built. Yeah. Okay. 
but doesn't um, when you grow older, doesn't the the it kind of come back? You know, where like your parents were teaching you a certain way, and you don't know the half, but then later on, as you grow older, that that half kind of you go back to the half where your mom told you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, does super ego come back? There, yeah, there you go. Um, it can. I mean, it can. De depending on who you, on what you become and, and who you are, like, like somebody who like maybe becomes like you kind of get, you know, you kind of you let you, let the id let your pleasure run wild right in your teens and twenties and you're having all kinds of fun, mm -hmm. and then um, you know you, then you get sucked into the corporate world and you're a cubicle warrior for the rest of your life. I mean, then it would make sense with some of those ego, or or super ego, which we'll get into next. Some of those demands telling you, follow the rules, don't do this, don't do that, you're going to get in trouble, right? So then, yeah, some of that might come back, but say for someone who's an artist, right? Who's a musician, and, 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 and music is all about the unconscious, right? Because music is about what cannot be named. What can, what, music is about pushing the boundaries of language, right? Because language is limiting, right? Language can only capture so much, which is why we have poetry and music, because Music and poetry are trying to push the bounds of language. They're trying to stretch language, which is why a song can capture something that um, language cannot capture. You know I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about? About how a song kind of gives you a feeling or an experience, an emotion yeah. that is really difficult to put into words. Right. It opens that. It, it opens that up. So if you're an artist, I mean, you might be kind of stuck in your unconscious for a long time. Um, a good example of this is in, in Kendrick Lamar's uh, Pimp of Butterfly album. He talks about, um, he, he's talking to Pop, he's talking to Tupac. He does this inter he, he does this kind of inter mock interview with Tupac, and, and Tupac's saying like, how in your 20s you, you have to express yourself and get everything out because by the time you're in your 30s, society has already crushed you, has already repressed you, you know what I mean? He's like, he's like you don't see too many loud mouth 30 year olds. You know what I mean? And because eventually, you know, if you don't stay, like, you know, like Kendrick, who's an artist, you know, stay, you know, make it in your artistry, you have to conform to society. So then super ego or, it, you know, ego would come back and try to help you do that. You know what I mean? But if you're an artist, then you're able to, to stay in your unconscious and make music, you know, forever, right? So that would be a kind of a, a good way of looking at it, of, of how we integrate these things and, and apply these things to our lives. Okay. Good question.